out as we go in here. So this is a match we've seen before today. Uh, this is going to be an Amethyst Ruby into a Sapphire Steel deck. Uh, Tyler, I believe, is on Sapphire Steel. Um, Javier on Amethyst Ruby or Ruby Amethyst, yes. uh, if you're going in the, the preferred Wait, order. Uh, how, how do you say it, Liam? I mean, I think Ruby Amethyst is the accepted way. Ruby Amethyst. Amethyst Ruby is... Um, alphabetical. Alphabetical. <laughs> a A R. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so this is a this is a fun matchup. Um, I do think that this matchup is a lot closer than than people like to think. I think the, the the common thought among the competitive circuit is that Ruby Amethyst is the favorite deck in this matchup. But I think that um, Sapphire Steel got a lot of tools. Um, recently that makes it a little bit more consistent. One of them is, uh, and we'll see if we see it on turn here one here, but there is the addition of Fortispheres, mm -hmm. which serve the same role as a Popsicle in that you play them to the board as a one-cost item, there it is, mm -hmm. and it draws you a card. Um, this makes this deck a lot more consistent. It gives you enough card draw that you no longer have to rely on whole new worlds as the way you're recharging your hand in the mid-game. Um, because a whole new world is a double-edged sword. Uh, it does help you out quite a bit, but when you're playing against decks like Ruby Amethyst, which are digging for endgame uh, cards, uh, sometimes it helps your opponent find those cards. And so if you can get around playing that and you can choose not to do it, that's that's helpful. Yeah. Th yeah, really great. And like you said, Fortisphere is kind of like a second Popsicle. So then you have eight of those in your deck potentially. And I think most players do play run four of each of those. Over on Javier's side, I think it's interesting here that we saw this Rafiki come down. Uh, a really great card, but it was one that we kind of saw falling out of the Ruby Amethyst deck when Bucky was around because of that discard. It was so important for Ruby Amethyst players to have a way to draw cards. And now that that is, you know, that squirrel has been uh, exterminated. <laughs> I think that we've seen, we're going to see maybe some more Rafikis back because we don't have to have so many of those cards like like the Chernabog's followers and the Magic Brooms and even Maleficent, all those cards to get you uh, more cards in hand that you can swap those out for something like Rafiki. Yeah. A um, couple other interesting cards here. You know, we have uh, an Argus being played on, on Tyler's mm -hmm. side. Um, Argus is a fun card. It's a very, very high strength on turn two. And, and usually this is built into Steel Decks for this particular matchup because against Ruby nowadays, you're looking out for Frenemy on turn two. Yeah, and, Flynn Rider. And, yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Flynn Rider, Frenemy. Frenemy, yeah. Um, yeah uh, <laughs> and that's a card that, you know, uh, often these players like to play on turn two and, and uh, Argus overpowers that. So uh, luckily we didn't see that. Or luckily for Tyler, he didn't see that on turn two. Um, but Argus is a card that gets around that. And a spell is a fascinating card uh, to yeah. have in this deck. This is a card that was really popular in set one. It fell out of favor for a while, and now you see um, uh, probably one or two, mm -hmm. usually not very many, work themselves back into some of these Amethyst decks. I think they're there primarily for the mirror match to give you an edge in the mirror, but in decks like this, uh, against decks like this that are a little more controlly, um, it also serves well to give you a lure you know, every turn, and it serves as, a, as an ink sink, as it were, allowing you to utilize extra ink that you have left over at the end of your turn um, to gain you lure. Yeah, oh, I like that, ink sink, yeah. yes. Yeah, I mean, it really helps you be more ink efficient. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The bad thing for Javier will be that steel is one of the ink colors that does have a lot of tools to banish items. So you have things like Rise of the Titans or the beast that can come in and banish an item. So there are some things on Tyler's side that he could potentially have that would come down and take care of that sorcerer's spell book. But for now, he's got some uncontested lore potentially on the board here. So we see on Tyler's side, he is exerting a lot of ink to bring down everyone's favorite fairy, Tinkerbell. <laughs> Uh, what a what a great card! Uh, beautiful art. Um, no, this is, this is one of the things about this this sapphire steel deck is. Um, I, I said this earlier in the day, but for for those who missed it, um, the this deck, the steel sapphire deck, or any deck with a lucky diamond, a Tamatoa, people think of it as a deck that's trying to primarily build this endgame engine and wants to win in a single turn. You know, at the end of the game, and that's what this deck is ultimately working towards is that is that endgame. Mm -hmm. But in these sapphire steel decks, there's a lot of high lore mid game characters from cards like Cogsworth or Tinkerbell where if you blink and give this deck any space before you know it, Tyler could be sitting with six or seven lore represented on the board and actually close this game out uh, questing with those characters rather than having to wait and rely on the Lucky Dime. Yeah, which that Lucky Dime can't come out until turn seven anyway, so if you're able to rack up a lot of lore in the mid game like you're talking about, then that just really puts you in a good position to close out the game. 
And we do see that rabbit come down on Javier's side, which, as we talked about in that last match that we watched, that getting that rabbit in the mid-game for the card draw to be able to cycle, you know, filter through your deck and find the cards that you need, really important. Um, I'm not sure what Javier has in his hand, but hopefully he has some mims there so he can start bouncing that rabbit and get some more cards. Yeah, that's one of the key components of this deck is getting that rabbit going and drawing for those endgame cards. Cards like a Be Prepared, which Javier would like to have in hand at the moment, knowing that there's a lot of you know, mid-game strong characters that can come down. But speaking of card draw, Tyler yes. with uh, Hiram Flavisham coming down, eating a popsicle, drawing two cards, immediately playing a popsicle, drawing yes. another card. Um, and so we're seeing Tyler do exactly what he wants to do here, uh, recharging his hand without having to rely on a whole new world. Um, and yeah. Yeah. Flamchester? Flam, Flamchester? <laughs> Flavisham. Fla uh, Fla Flavisham. Flavisham. Yes, you have to say in the accent. Flam uh, what is it? Flammerhammer. <laughs> yeah, Flavisham is a fun card, and when you can really get that draw engine going, um, it's a little dangerous when you're sitting on the other side of the table because you know that there's other cards, like the whole new world that might be coming. It's so many things that Tyler could be pulling with every time that he eats one of those popsicles. Yeah. And the card draw in this deck is so important, not only, again, to find those pieces that you want for the end of the game, but um, this deck relies on Fishbone Quill oftentimes to build up a significant ink pool uh, that allows you to do much more than your opponents on any mm -hmm. given turn. The problem is those cards come from your hand. Yes. So you've got to be leveraging your Flavishams, leveraging your card draw, and then leaning into a whole new world if necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I think only if necessary nowadays um, in order to recharge your hand and allow you to build that ink advantage. Yeah, and we did see Tyler ink a uh, bell, strength but special earlier in the game. So we know he has those in his decks, which is a really wonderful card. And when you can ramp up the ink on your side, uh, Bell Quest for five if you have 10 ink or more in your ink well. So that is something that Javier is going to have to watch out for. And we did see a little bit of bouncing rabbits over on his side. Um, very fun and very effective to get that card advantage. And here we have a quest. We'll eat that popsicle. We'll get another couple cards. They are delicious. Being able to <laughs> utilize Flavisham like more. Now we've gotten six cards, I think, off this Flavisham at least. At least, yeah. Um, being able to utilize Flavisham more than once, uh, more than twice, uh, is is extra good. I do see the Tamatoa there in Tyler's hand. I, I have missed whether or not we have the dime. That's a card that he's going to want to slam down here uh, sooner rather than later. Yeah, Tamatoa, I do see. Which, of course, that Tomato can bring back those popsicles and then Flowersham can eat them all over again. Keep that whole cycle going. Yep, just like Nick Wilde does in Zootopia, recycling the popsicles. <laughs> you buy one jumbo pop for $15 and then you sell all the little mini pops for $2 each and make a profit. And as if you could see the future, here it is, <laughs> the Tomato and pulling back the popsicle, yep. playing it again, giving Flowersham more food uh, to devour. And uh, yeah, so we talk about, uh, we sometimes use the word engine builders in games or in TCGs. And, and what that means is that you're putting certain cogs in place. You're putting certain cards in place on the board to allow you to do these um, combos, usually you know, two or three actions all at the same time. And, and this, is, uh, this is an example of this engine in action here. Um, if that Flavisham stays on the board, what you're going to have is a scenario where uh, you can quest with Flavisham, eat the popsicle, Tamatoa quest, bring the popsicle back, you play the popsicle and now draw a card now you've gotten three cards and the popsicle is available for you again to perhaps use another flavisham um, or something like that so uh, this is an example of, of an engine built on the board mm -hmm. um, and we'll see how much tyler gets to utilize it before javier can do something about it yep we do have friends on the other side being sung by the rabbit over on javier's side cards the cards the cards would tell him what options that he has here and he is going to quest and I was going to say, there must be a be prepared, be prepared if he's doing that. So there it is. Yeah, I mean, Flavisham by itself is a card you want off the board. Tamato you want mm -hmm. off the board. Both of them together represents a significant threat for the reasons we talked about before. Um, but Tyler able to get some good value out of them and has you know plenty of cards in hand to, to kind of rebuild here and answer. Yeah, be prepared is one of those cards that really can be just a nice reset of the game. Yeah, that's one of the challenges with Be Prepared in these Ruby Amethyst decks is uh, in, in previous iterations of this deck, way back in set one, you often included cards that cost uh, eight or nine, like Maleficent Dragon, which could sing, sing. Be Prepared mm -hmm. and then leave you with cards uh, with ink available to then rebuild your board. Most of the time now in these Ruby uh, Amethyst decks, though, you have to play it 
you know, with, with your ink rather than singing because there's just not avail a lot of available for you mm -hmm. other than perhaps an eight cost Sisu um, or some decks used to run Scar, but I don't think you see him uh, that much nowadays. And so it allows your opponent then, if they have the cards in hand, to respond immediately uh, playing cards to board. And that's what we see Tyler doing here. Yeah. Um, what's nice for Javier is he does still have that spell book on his board. Tyler hasn't found an answer for that yet. So even if Javier, you know, whatever characters he might get on the board for his next turn, he's still going to be able to gain one lore from that spell book as long as he has the one ink available to exert that item. An interesting, we do see Rise of the Titans here go into the inkwell mm. uh, to enable playing this Tamatoa. Uh, that is, uh, it's an interesting choice that tells us something. Rise of the Titan is in this deck primarily to deal with the castles. Mm -hmm. uh, castles is just a card that Tyler doesn't have a lot of answers for. Even on the board right now with the Tamatoa, you only have six strength to deal with, you know, a seven willpower castle. But um, Tyler indicating, I think, that he's not, he's, he's not super concerned about the castles at this point and feels like he has enough in his hand to deal with it. And so there goes Rise into the Inkwell. What do you think about his, op his, uh, his choice here to not use Rise of the Titans to banish the Sorcerer's Spellbook on Javier's side of the board? I mean, I think Tyler would, would still like to have Rise. I think the Spellbook isn't all that threatening to him right now. I think he would have rather saved that Rise for uh, a castle for if he came to play later. But, but if you look at the ink totals, like that, <laughs> yes. that Rise was the difference between a Tamatoa being on the board and not being on the board. And at this point, um, you know, Tyler would love to have that Tamatoa stick, uh, be able to start pulling ah. back cards from his, uh, from his discard pile. Are going to see a Maui? And there it is. Eye. Yes. So that talkative puppet. So Pinocchio, talkative puppet, is a card that we saw a lot in Ruby Amethyst in previous sets. We didn't see it a lot in the Bucky meta, but here we see it again. And a talkative puppet is able to exert chosen character when he enters play, which he used to exert the Mickey Mouse detective, and then Maui could come in and banish. That is true. I feel like Ruby Amethyst players fall into the love talkative puppet camp or don't care about <laughs> talkative puppet camp because you see him creep into various versions of this deck uh, in every meta that we've seen. Um, one of the things that makes it especially good in this deck, though, is um, that you're running a lot of bounce cards. You're mm -hmm. running Madame and Foxes, etc. So you can use that talkative puppet numerous times. Mm -hmm. uh, use him, bring him back, use him, bring him back, especially when you pair it with Maui. So. Oh, look at this. We've got a guest on. Gaston Intellectual Powerhouse. No one quests like Gaston. <laughs> no one draws you cards like Gaston. Absolutely. Um, Gaston is a card <laughs> that allows you to look at the top uh, three cards of your deck, pick a card, put it in your hand, and the rest, I believe, go on the bottom of it, your library. It's really like a develop your brain, but on a character. But extra, extra, yeah, developed here. Extra um, developed. <laughs> this is this is another card that, that crept into a lot of ruby sapphire decks and uh, sapphire steel decks uh, here. Again, it's not in every list, so you see them in some, not in others, but it does two things for you. One is it allows you to find your uh, some of your key combo pieces, but two, it has three lore on it, so it pairs very well with dimes in the end game, allowing you to gain three lore off the dime and then three lore off the quest if it sticks around. Mm -hmm. uh, so a fun card to see um, and doing work here, getting Tyler uh, a card off the top of his deck. So if I could share some fun things that I learned about this particular guest on um, at D23, Brian Miller, one of the co-creators of Disney Arcana, was talking about how Gaston, this Floodborne character, is. It, it's not that he, Gaston is smart. He's just smarter. He thinks he's smart. <laughs> he, he thinks he's smart. And that the plan that he's drawn on the chalkboard is the same exact plan of what he did in the movie, but the smarter part is that he wrote it down this time. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's, uh, sometimes a game, little inches, little exactly. improvement. Exactly, yes. Sisu coming down on Javier's side of the board, which does not do much because there are no characters that can be banished. It's, again, it's it's characters with two strength or less that get banished when Sisu comes into play, but a nice quester here. That's true, and a, and a body on the board. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, as you suggested, it does two things. One, you know, Javier is sitting at 10 lore. Um, and although that's not super threatening, as soon as any of these Sapphire decks, I'm uh, sorry, these Amethyst decks, get to 15, 16, mm -hmm. 17 lore, those goat bounces become very threatening. And again, that spell book is there. Still able to there. It will tip you up to 20. So, oh, and now we have a dime. Yeah, waiting to play that dime. And that dime is going to do a lot of work here. We have one, two, three, four, five items on the board. So Tamato with six willpower yeah and this is where you see those sapphire steel decks going from you know zero it's like like a car zero to 100 you know in two seconds flat because that between that dime and tomatoa he's going to quest for 
quite a lot here. I mean, six off the quest, six off the dime, three off Gaston. That's 15 lore in a single turn uh, if he so chooses. Wow. Yeah, I wonder how Javier is feeling right now. He was sitting pretty good there, but that is a little uh, scary over here on Tyler's side of the board. And that's what these lucky dime decks are designed to do. They're designed in the end game to oh, win in one turn. You know what? He actually quests for seven because he has one, two, three, four, oh. five, and then the fishbone. Yeah, I missed. <laughs> I, I didn't count the dime I, itself. At the dime <laughs> itself, yes. Yep. My Twitch strat is very upset. No, <laughs> I, yeah, I didn't count the dime itself. So yeah, that's right. Seven and seven um, plus the three. Uh, so that's he, 17, all the way up to 2 to 19 lore. Wow. Should be a 19 lore right now. Wow. That is a swing. Yeah, and it's a problem because when you have a lucky dime on the board, any character now wins uh, Tyler the game instantly. Yes. Um, so Javier not only has to clear all the characters off the board, but then he has to hope that Tyler has no characters in hand and doesn't draw into one. Um, it's a tough spot to be in. So uh, a be prepared here would be good. Any <laughs> He has a Maui. I mean, he has what he needs to clean up the board right here. Um, can gain another lore off the spell book, but um, gosh, uh, again, one character. Yeah. And, and, you know, at this point, uh, Javier plays this, and he turns to Tyler and says, if you have a character in hand, um, you win the game. Uh, do you have a character? Right. And Tyler says, ah, I do. I have a character. <laughs> um, and there it is. Um, wow. Wow. What, so what was that, 17 lore in one turn? 17 lore, yeah. That and, uh, is... Pretty incredible. Lucky Dime, of course, if you don't know, is from DuckTales. Woo! -woo. There you go. <laughs> I was hoping for that. And I, yeah, it's just such a fun card. Um, one of the things that I think is very on theme, which uh, you don't see this a lot in, in competitive decks, but there's um, one of the, the um, Magicka Dispel character that she can quest for the cost of an item, but she doesn't have any lore herself, so, or so she can't use Lucky Dime. It's really interesting. So uh, that's really it's, it's, it's a fun little like theme play on where Magicka can can get the Lucky Dime, but she can't actually use it. You know, so Scrooge McDuck wins in the end. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Oh, and there's a uh, thank you to our, our card prompter here for bringing up Magicka Dispel. Yeah, a super fun card. Yeah, won't see her in this deck, but for sure, full of flavor. Full uh, of flavor. It. Tyler off to the races with Ford of Spear on turn one. So Ford of Spear, I, I want to talk about some math here for a second. So um, let's say that you draw a hand of seven cards mm -hmm. um, and you're going to mulligan five. Um, and one of your goals is to get a Ford of Spear on turn one, which then you can use the Hiram Flavisham, et cetera. With the four popsicles in your deck, you have a 60% chance looking at 12 cards mm -hmm. to see one of those in your opening turn. Adding in the four Fortispheres took you to an 85% chance. Wow. Um, so if you're mulligating five cards off your initial uh, draw, um, you have an 85% chance to see one of these cards on your first turn, and uh, and as we do, and sometimes, sometimes one of the more than that. as well. Yeah, and I think if you ask any player, they will tell you, how key that altering your open opening hand is to this game. It's not just playing the game itself, but what you choose to alter, you know, how many cards you're choosing to discard and redraw, um, that it makes such a huge difference in the outcome of the game. Very true. So having your hair, uh, I think, you know, didn't have such a good game one, but um, the key to victory for Javier here is to really drive the lore total as mm -hmm. fast as possible, as early as possible. Um, talking to Puppet is not, not the card you want to <laughs> no. see on turn two. I'm sure he would have rather seen a Flynn Rider here to have that Flynn Sisu follow up, but, you know, he, he is getting bodies on the board, but not quite able to um, really get that early lore gain that you would want to see, especially against a Sapphire Steel deck. As we saw, the longer this game goes on, um, the more things are going to fall in Tyler's favor, I think. Uh, that's true, and I, I, it's, it's absolutely true. One of the reasons why it's so important to drive this lore total is, you know, Tyler is going to spend resources doing things every turn, and what Tyler wants to be doing is he wants to be spending resources drawing cards. He wants to put some of his key uh, item components onto the board. He doesn't want to spend resources responding to Javier's threats. Mm -hmm. So if Javier is able to, in the early game here, get a Flynn Rider on the board that Tyler has to respond to, or a Sisu, which is a, which not only activates the Flynn, but is a two-lore character and is going to be questing every turn, and then then the icing on the cake would be drop a castle on turn mm -hmm. four, which is getting you two lore a turn. Tyler is going to have to spend time finding answers, finding removal, responding to those rather than building up the engine that he wants to build. Um, and at this point, I, I don't know that Javier 
um, has the cards he wants to have in the early game. Let's see if we see a Sisu here. Oh, perhaps. gosh. I don't think he's playing anything oh, here on turn three, which is really unfortunate. <laughs> yeah, he, he quested with Ponocchio and Rafiki there, but unfortunately not able to put another character on the board. Um, like you're saying, it's really that Flynn, Sisu, and then Castle, ideally, to get all that lore early in the game that would be the line that he would want to see. Unfortunately, not in, in this case. And it just really goes to show the very the amount of variance in Disney Arcana. You know, every game you can build your deck a certain way, and like you're talking about with math and probability, you know what's likely to come up. But every game is going to be different because you know there's some amount of luck involved. You can be as skilled of a player as possible, but sometimes you just don't get the cards that you need. That's collectible card games. We talk yep. about math and hypergeometric math and, and probability all day because yeah, at the end of the day, you need a little bit of luck on your side uh, as much as you can stack the odds in your favor. Yeah, and I know I keep I I say this almost every challenge, but it's just so true um, that. Where skill meets luck is where your opportunities are in this game. And so if you can have the skills, develop yourself as a player, and then if, when the, those lucky dr card draws come, that's when it gives you opportunities to get ahead. Right. Tyler here, you know, we talked about uh, Javier being not on his own opening, but Tyler uh, on his ideal opening, I mm -hmm. think, uh, dropping a Popsicle followed by a Fishbone Quill and then Flavish him on turn four to draw you two cards is exactly where he wants to be. And let's talk about Smee for a second. Uh, Smee is a fun card here, which uh, can do a few things for Tyler. One, in, in a game where he's kind of rushing and pushing the lore totals, it allows you to quest uh, a few times to get you know some extra lore. But it also, at this point, is a three-strength character on the board. And so if Tyler is worried at all about that castle and wants to start doing some some damage to it. Um, Smee is a card that can go into that castle, take it down within striking range of an Along Came Zeus. Um, so definitely something that Tyler can use to control the board if he is at all worried about uh, Javier's lore creeping up at this point. Yeah. So we're getting a look at the player's hands here a little bit. Can't see quite what's in Tyler's hand. Another Flavorsham, which, gosh, I tell you, whenever I play a game and I'm able to remove a Flavorsham, like I play a brawl or something, get Flavorsham off the board, and then the player immediately puts down another Flavorsham, I'm just like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. uh. Because, I mean, stopping that draw engine for the Sapphire Steel player is so key to be able to get ahead. That's true. So some looking at his hand, you know, we have we have a few choices here. Um, ba boom, ba boom. You know, we've gone through our, our popsicles and our fortispheres. So at this point, we could, you know, eat that fishbone quill um, and draw into some more cards. Um, it's not as I, tasty as the popsicle. It is not. But I think the right play here, uh, you know, is getting that Cogsworth on the board. Mm. Um, Cogsworth just a just a powerhouse. Mm. Uh, this is a card a two five. It gives all of your other characters resist, um, and it has ward, so it can sit there. Uh, can't be chosen by anything that does targeted. Uh, or damage, mm -hmm. um, and it just protects your other characters. The other th fun thing that it does here is, uh, you will, you can see its effect on Smee and uh, Flavisham, the resist, meaning they don't take any damage from these challenges. But Smee also uh, will damage himself every turn if there's no captain on the board. But given that uh, Cogsworth prevents one of that damage, Smee now can be exerted every single turn uh, without any fear of that. Oh, gosh. So getting a little bit of a look here at Javier's hand, I said, oh, gosh, because um, I see so many uninkable cards in his hand and a lot of high-cost uninkables, and I think that's why we didn't see a lot from him um, the first few turns was that he just had a lot of in his opening hand, even though he altered, he had a lot of high-cost and uninkable cards, unfortunately. Yeah, and that's that's a great point because we uh, looking at the ink we missed an ink drop here this turn mm -hmm. um, and so a choice here to put the inkable sisu onto the castle to try to get one extra card rather than putting it into the ink well at this point javier has to be thinking get to turn seven or get to seven ink and be prepared that yep. is my out uh, because this deck has a lot of high lore mid-game characters we see a beast tragic hero in tyler's hand which could come down here and put another two lore on the board mm -hmm. and so uh, javier at this point is like give me every extra card i can possibly get to give me the ink and then the be prepared to keep me in this game. Yeah. I can't remember if I saw the be prepared in his hand. I did see a rabbit and a sisu and uh, but it was all <laughs> all uninkables and and that just feels bad. That's why balancing the uninkable to inkable ratio is really important, but sometimes you just get bricked with uninkable cards in your hand and there's nothing you can do about it. And sometimes your opponent just gets every answer they need, every card they need. Like what's happening over here with Tyler? There's so many options. 
he has tons of ink in his ink well and is sitting pretty here. Uh, he only has two lore on the board, but like we saw last game, I mean, he quested for 17 in one turn, so who knows what could happen here. Yeah, and against against any deck... Oh, interesting. So instead, uh, we're foregoing the beast, uh, Tragic Hero, instead getting the uh, Lucky Dime on the board. Uh, we're going to use it, uh, choosing... Oh, one of those. Uh, yeah, um, right. They all... Well, yeah, the Cogsworth quest for two, so uh, sure. Pick one of them. <laughs> um, get some extra lore. And uh, yeah, you know, and anytime you're playing Sapphire Steel, uh, I was talking to... Uh, Actually, I was talking to uh, Hal Brady, a very good um, Ruby Sapphire player, um, and he was talking about there's always this moment in the game. You have this seven-cost Lucky Dime that you can't ink, so it sits in your hand, it's a brick, but mm -hmm. you need to get into the board. And you have to pick, like, your perfect moment mm -hmm. uh, to slam that on the board, forego doing everything else in order to get you that lore engine. Um, and Tyler, to do that here, of course, oh. you know... With Another uninkable card. Look at that spellbook, uh, Rabbit. He did draw... Oh, he does have a... I have a friends on the other side. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. But yeah, just looking for inkables at this point. We have a he few. He does have a C be prepared, seer, but he only has four ink. Gosh, that's got to feel bad. Mm. Yeah, be prepared is really the answer. Um, so let's see. We will play the rabbit, draw another card. Um, you know, definitely want to ink something uh, to get us a little bit closer. But, you know, Tyler here, knowing that we've missed an ink drop, we have three more turns. Uh, well, two more turns after this until the Be Prepared is available. Can kind of take a risk, go mm -hmm. a little bit wide if he wants to, and try to close this thing out quicker uh, than he otherwise would. Yeah, Tyler's sitting with seven lore on his board right now, and that's without him playing any additional ca characters. Of course, we do see that Tomatoa and also that Gaston in his hand, which both will quest for, for quite a lot, plus having that Lucky Dime. Six, seven, so seven lore represented on the board. And Javier's just got that five ink. Oh, gosh, yeah, it's looking pretty good for Tyler right now. Um, I mean, I don't know if Javier has two more turns to get to be prepared, and that's the problem right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we will want to draw into on turn turn six. We have cards like Madame Medusa that are available, mm -hmm. which can remove at least the Smee or the Flavisham, probably the Smee because of the extra lore this turn. Yeah. But oh, this is. There's Gaston. Oh, here comes Gaston again. Um, no one draws you cards like Gaston. Well, <laughs> some cards draw you <laughs> some cards, cards like Gaston, like Gaston. But, uh, yes. <laughs> but certainly very few. Um, but able to look here, pick uh, a card out of the top three, send the rest to the bottom, and that gives uh, Tyler an extra lore this turn because now the Lucky Dime, instead of choosing one of the two mm -hmm. lore characters, can choose Gaston and gain three lore um, instead of two lore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Sisu is exerted. Do you think that the, he's going to look at challenging that Sisu to take away one of the card draw that Javier would get on his next turn? Um, of course, Queen's Castle, you get to draw an extra card for each character that is at that location at the beginning of your turn, and that Sisu is exerted. I mean, there's certainly ways you can play this safe and ways that you can, you know, kind of push yourself uh, towards victory. I think in this instance, you know, <laughs> Tyler's probably making the right call and saying, I'm going to get as I'm going to get within dime striking distance. Dime striking distance. Yes. I, I, you know, Tyler has to be doing the calculations and saying, I don't think there are enough shenanigans in this deck to uh, to take me out of it. But on the off chance, I'm just going to get as close as possible. I know you can't take away my lore. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I can get within a dime uh, of winning the game, that's probably, you know, where he wants to be. Yeah. And, and that Lucky Dime really is what, what won him the game last, what won him the first game. And I think that we're going to see that again here in game two. Javier questing with a rabbit? Yeah, I just don't think that he's quite within striking distance here. No, you, need, you need to be prepared. Oh, we are going to sh uh, we shift the, the CCU. We show him to be prepared. Um, Oh, so he's saying, yes, be prepared. Yep, shift the Sisu. That, that is, is fun. That is a line. I'm that, not, all right. I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that line <laughs> Didn't coming. see that. Um, that was fantastic. Yes. So <laughs> she, Sisu, so you talked about removing the Sisu. Yes. Had that line occurred to me, um, I would have said that that's a safe play. So Sisu shifts for six. So yeah. it basically lets you cheat out the be prepared, you know, a turn early. So questing with the rabbit should have tipped us off because we're like, why, why, why quest with the rabbit? Why um, But uh, there it is. So drawing an extra card off the rabbit and able to banish everything. Of course, Tyler now within four lore of winning the game. Um, if we have uh, Tamatoa now is going to be three lore with those two items. Now we add another item that's four lore and with enough ink left over uh, to activate the dime, yep. and that should be four ink to close out, or four lore to close out the game. Yep, fist um, bump there. Yep. 
<laughs> well played, both players. Yeah, you know, uh, we've talked before about how in Ruby Amethyst, you don't often see 